Welcome to Lowell Ghost Goths and Ghouls, an audio tour. Upriver in Pawtucketville, on a spot known as Druid's Hill, is LeBlanc Park, home to a playground, baseball field, and a mysterious stone circle on a mound by the parking lot. Actually, it's more like a stone egg, or some say a planchette, the pointer on a Ouija board. But whatever the shape, at least one local is convinced that it contains the power to do some pretty strange things. But first, what do we know about Druid's Hill? According to Dorothy Hayden of the American Institute for Archaeological Research, there is no written record of the stone's origins. They have simply always been there. The land appears in historical records as far back as 1629. It was acquired from the Native Americans who lived on it by a European named John Webb around 1650, and later purchased by a Mr. Varnum, referred to as both Thomas and Samuel, in 1667. It remained in his family for 250 years. In 1906, a health camp was built on the site. Ten years later, it was expanded into an isolation hospital for tuberculosis patients. The hospital was raised in 1953, and the land became a public park. In 1985, archaeologist James Pendergast obtained a permit and funding from the Massachusetts Historical Commission to excavate the mound. He dug through nearly 100 years of refuse before discovering that each of the stones rests in a socket made of early 20th century paving stones. They also discovered that around the perimeter of the mound, there is a little wall consisting of paving stones laid end to end on edge in a single file at a depth of 15 centimeters. According to some sources, the stones originally stood about 100 feet west of their current location and were moved to make way for the hospital. Allegedly, the mound and stones were installed as closely as possible to their original arrangement. Why would someone go to the trouble and expense of moving and reinstalling the stones with such care? Some sources refer to it as a Victorian folly, meaning it was purely decorative. Or perhaps it was an attempt to honor the legacy of the Native Americans who once lived on the site. But there is a more sinister theory, tying back to the site's alleged resemblance to a planchette. Some say that a mysterious Englishman, who may or may not have been the notorious ceremonial magician Alistair Crowley, requested the mound's construction, hoping to tap into the site's energy for his nefarious purposes. Could this be true? While we do know that the spiritualist movement was thriving in the Boston area at this time, details in any connection to this site are scant, but a more modern visitor has reported some strange experiences. Daniel V. Bodilian wrote on his blog, Myself and two friends had gone to the park and visited the Stones one autumn evening in 1984. For reasons unclear to me at this point, we engaged in the following activity. I stood in the center of the mound on the circle and did a special meditation while my two friends stood off to the side to observe. As far as I recall, I experienced nothing untoward or unusual during the meditation, which really didn't last for more than 10 minutes. However, upon rejoining my friends, they were all agog with the revelation that I had disappeared for a goodly length of time, upwards of 20 to 30 seconds. They described it that I simply blinked out and blinked back in it later. Again, I did not experience anything of that nature from my vantage point. He says that he later brought his brother-in-law to the site with him without explaining what had happened before. After Bodilian meditated for 10 minutes, his brother-in-law quite excitedly reported that he had vanished instantly and later reappeared, only to fade out slowly and then fade back in again. Bodilian says, I have no idea what actually happened those two nights, but as far as I know, I have never disappeared since although there have been plenty of times I wish I could have. The Boot Cotton Mills were in operation from 1835 to 1958, employing thousands of women, men, and children. People say that some of them are still hanging around. Sightings seem to center around the building that now houses a museum, particularly the second floor, where people have reported seeing shadows and hearing unexplained noises and the cries of a young woman, who legend says met her death from a fall down the stairs. On the first floor of the museum, a visitor saw a woman in period dressed so convincing that she assumed it was an actress, but there were no reenactments on the schedule that day. Working in the mills could be a precarious existence, particularly for the immigrants who replaced the New England farm girls who made up the first wave of mill work workers. They could lose their jobs if they became pregnant or got injured in a workplace accident. For those with nowhere else to go, there was always the Tewksbury Almshouse. 
The Massachusetts Public Health Museum is housed in the former administration building of Tewkesbury Hospital. It's an imposing piece of Victorian Gothic architecture with large stone steps leading up to the former window where patients once handed over their belongings and entered the institutional world. No doubt there were caring staff and medical personnel who did their best for their vulnerable patients. But there seems to have been at least one dark period in its long history, and perhaps some lingering spirits. The facility began as the Tewkesbury Almshouse in 1852 as an asylum for paupers. Originally intended to house 500 people, it had already taken in 800 by the end of its first month of operation. Two years later, there were more than 2,000, and only 14 employees to take care of them. But by 1874, the population expanded to include patients with mental illnesses and chronic conditions. The almshouse was known to have an unusually high death rate, particularly among infants, and had been dogged for years by rumors of abuse and corrupt management. In 1883, Lowell's Benjamin Butler, newly elected governor, lawyer, and former Civil War major general, formed a committee to investigate. According to his findings, not only were the rumors true, but affairs at the Tewkesbury Almshouse were more outrageous than anyone had imagined. Inmates were found to be dangerously undernourished. Some were described as little more than living skeletons. They were dressed only in thin hospital gowns, their own clothes allegedly sold off by staff. Former inmates told of physical and sexual abuse, and conditions were said to be so unsanitary that rats were found gnawing on patients, both dead and alive. Inmates who were alive were put to work sewing or knitting, producing goods to be sold. But according to witnesses at the hearing, what the almshouse produced most efficiently were corpses, and the owner found ways to make them pay well. Dr. Sherman H. Sanborn of Woburn testified that in February 1878, while he was a dental student in Boston, he saw a man with a gray beard pull up in a covered wagon with a corpse to sell. It was a woman who the man said had come from Tewkesbury. The price was $14, and the students pooled their money and bought her. The almshouse had deals with the Harvard Medical School and colleges in Boston to sell corpses for dissection. In some cases, newly buried corpses were dug up at night. In others, the body was never buried. Instead, a log was put in the coffin for weight. Sometimes there was no funeral at all. The body was simply put in a pork barrel and shipped to the school. This practice was not unheard of at the time. Medical students were eager for fresh cadavers to practice on. But another accusation was even more outrageous. Some bodies were said to be skinned and their hides sent out to be tanned. In one case, the tanned skin from a woman's breasts was found at a store in Boston being made into shoes. Governor Butler reflected on this during a hearing. What do you suppose people want of them? Well, there are old men and young men of jaded passions, worn out prematurely by their vices, and if they can put their feet in slippers made from a woman's breast, perhaps they can feed their imaginations. While the almshouse owner denied tanning the skin, there was no denying that it came from an inmate. Another piece of tanned human skin that was discovered had a tattoo of a crucifix along with the name Charles J. Eklund and his date of birth. Eklund had been a registered inmate at the Tewkesbury Almshouse. The story became national news, partially because of its sensational nature and partially because Governor Butler was actively seeking the Democratic nomination for president. The Massachusetts legislature and the investigating committee were controlled by Republicans, and the issue became highly partisan. When the committee released its report, claiming that all was well at the Tewkesbury Almshouse and all the problems had been in the past, they were accused by some newspapers of whitewashing the issue. Other papers accused Butler of exaggerating the story for political gain. The New York Times said that the investigation, quote, had been from first to last an infamous burlesque on a decent public inquiry. In any case, the investigation led to reform of the Tewkesbury Almshouse. Today known as Tewkesbury Hospital, it is a fully functioning modern institution and perhaps with a few lingering reminders of the past. Psychic C.C. Carroll, who once worked at the hospital, recalled seeing shadows moving across empty hallways and entering rooms. When she asked about them, other employees would shrug and say it was just the ghost. Carol had also experienced hearing the sound of a woman weeping and feeling a tap on the shoulder in an unused tunnel under the buildings. If you go, I highly recommend checking out the nearby Pine Cemetery, where an estimated 10,000 former inmates are buried in overgrown graves with little metal markers. 
It's plenty creepy on its own, whether or not you believe the stories of hauntings associated with the spot, including a dog with strange leathery skin that stalks visitors, a wispy lady in white, and of course, disembodied screams in the night. <laughs> 